Now that we've looked at abnormal psychology and you have a sense of all of the different disorders that therapists must deal with, it's important to look at how these disorders are treated. And that is the purpose of today's lesson. There are two major types of therapies. You have psychotherapy and biomedical therapy. Psychotherapy involves talking things out with a professional therapist. This might be a psychologist, it might be a psychiatrist, but it's someone who is qualified and certified to help you deal with your problems. Biomedical therapy is therapy which uses medical methods or pharmacology to help deal with various disorders. That will be the subject of a later lesson. In order to really understand how these therapies work, it's important to have a sense of the history of treatment. Now, both forms of therapy have significant histories, although the roots of psychotherapy most often lie in the realm of religious institutions. Religious leaders have long been relied upon for their advice and wisdom, and some religious practices, such as the Catholic Sacrament of Reconciliation or Confession, may even have evolved from a basic belief that admitting wrongdoing or getting something off your chest is helpful in overcoming an obstacle. However, as we've seen, many psychological disorders manifest themselves in eccentric or violent actions, which most usually prompted medical intervention. Well, for much of organized medical history, most therapies involving the medically ill has been biomedical in nature. Our earliest medical texts refer to treatments that we now call alternative, the use of herbs, for example, to treat an ailment. In the late ancient period, the theory of the four humors took hold, thanks in part to Hippocrates. Incidentally, this theory wasn't fully discredited until 1858 when Rudolf Virchow published his theories on cellular pathology. This theory of the four humors, which was really codified by Galen, held that there were four humors in the body, black bile, yellow bile, phlegm, and blood, and that these humors were in balance when a person was healthy. Illness was caused by an imbalance, and it was treated based on which of the four humors was out of balance. It was Galen who applied this concept of the humors to various personalities for the first time. According to Galen, people who were sanguine had an excess of blood in their systems. These people are social, charismatic, and generally pleasure-seeking. Thus, people who indulged in so much pleasurable activity that was ultimately self-destructive, like drug use or unsafe sex, needed to have their blood drawn. People who were choleric had too much yellow bile. These were people who were often leaders because they tended toward either aggression or great passion, and generally they had strong wills. They were domineering and could be tyrannical, but tended to fall into depression if they faced a setback. People who were melancholic had an excess of black bile. They were overly introverted and tended toward great creativity, but at the same time were easily hurt by the world and its fortunes. Their perfectionism and extreme caution, to the point of severe procrastination, could make them unfit to function in the world. Nowadays, these people would probably be individuals who have various anxiety or mood disorders. And finally, people who were phlegmatic had too much phlegm. They were generally relaxed and quiet, but they could be too lazy and fearful of change. They also tended towards what we would call passive aggressiveness nowadays. Now, obviously, draining the various humors to preserve balance was largely unsuccessful in the treatment of mental illness. Now, unfortunately, the early days of therapy specifically for the mentally ill saw dangerous treatments. The first serious attempt to determine successful treatments for people labeled mentally ill began about the mid-1500s in England. In 1547, King Henry VIII granted a charter to Bethlehem Hospital, which had been in existence already for about 300 years, which allowed it to specialize in treating mentally ill patients. As such, it was converted into an asylum and was eventually nicknamed Bedlam. In reality, Bethlehem Asylum was more of a prison in which to house the mentally ill. There, they were beaten, experienced bloodletting, and, very often, were subjected to ice baths until the individual passed out or suffered a seizure in the hopes that, upon awakening, they would magically be better. Once electricity could be manufactured, these patients were sometimes electrocuted, and without any knowledge of just how much electrocution the body can take, you can imagine what the results were. At the end of the 18th century, during the tail end of the Enlightenment in Europe, a physician by the name of Philippe Pinel began working with the inmates at the Bicetra Asylum in Paris. He began by unchaining the inmates, insisting that they needed to be treated more humanely. 
Well, throughout the 19th century, humane treatment of the mentally ill meant that, rather than being mostly chained to beds and or walls, they were medicated. But they were still left in asylums and not integrated into society. In the modern world, five different types of psychotherapies have emerged to help in treating various disorders. We're going to go through each one so you have a better understanding of what they entail. Beginning with Freud, treatment of the mentally ill began to focus not just on the symptoms of illness, but also on the reasons behind the illness. Obviously based on Freud's theories of personality, he believed that psychoanalysis made patients aware of unconscious impulses and fears that were causing anxiety. For Freud, gaining insight is the first step to solving the problem. Psychoanalysis is a therapy that's referred to as directive, in that the therapist directs the patient in how they should react and how they should move forward with their health. Dream interpretation formed a large part of Freud's psychoanalytic method. Freud was more interested in the latent, the hidden symbolic meaning of dreams, than he was in the manifest content of the dream. Interpreting dreams, he believed, would give the therapist a true sense of what it was the patient was hiding from. Free association is a method in which the patient describes anything and everything that comes to mind. The belief behind this method is that hidden unconscious concerns would emerge as part of the conversation. Now, interestingly enough, free association has made its way into the educational world. I'll bet many of you had to do some sort of brainstorming that was free association and looked something like that. Unfortunately, therapists sometimes had to deal with resistance. Resistance is a behavior, most usually an unwillingness to talk further, that impedes therapy. A patient's unwillingness to continue conversation meant that the therapy was coming uncomfortably close to repressed material, likely the source of the anxiety. And rather than back away from the topic, a good therapist would move forward with it and force the patient to confront this anxiety. Transference is when the therapist becomes a symbol of parental authority. This point comes only after a patient has come to trust the therapist and sees them as unjudgmental. While a patient would initially transfer positive feelings that he or she had about the authority figure, they may, via therapy, come to transfer negative feelings instead and in that way reveal the source of their anxiety. Modern psychotherapists have greatly modified Freud's structure for conducting a psychoanalytic session. Now, the client, not a patient, not someone who is ill, is empowered to sit, stand, or pace during the session, and a psychoanalyst is more directive, meaning that he or she will ask direct questions, suggest helpful behaviors, and give opinions and interpretations about the conversation. These new methods are now referred to as psychodynamic therapy which is typically shorter in duration than Freud's traditional sessions. While psychoanalytic and psychodynamic therapies are incredibly popular, a major criticism is that there is little scientific research to support Freud's original claims. Additionally, this type of therapy often takes years to produce results, and it requires the client to be fairly intelligent and verbally able to express his or her ideas. As a result, people who are very withdrawn or suffer from severe psychotic disorders are not good candidates for this type of therapy. Now, in contrast, humanistic therapy does not focus on the unconscious, but rather on the conscious, subjective experiences of emotions and people's sense of self. They also focus on individuals' more immediate past rather than earlier childhood experiences. Now, this is based on Carl Rogers' person-centered theories of personality, Humanistic therapy, therefore, stresses self-actualization, personal responsibility, and freedom of choice. This form of therapy could almost be called self-help because it is very non-directive. The therapist is basically a sounding board while the person seeking help works through their own problems. A part of the focus of this person-centered therapy is to help a person realize their own strength to solve their problems, to increase self-esteem, and to get closer to matching real and ideal selves. There are four basic elements to Rogers' person-centered therapy. Reflection is a technique the therapist uses to allow clients to continue to talk and have insights without the interference of the therapist's own interpretation and possible biases. A therapist literally reflects, mirrors, a client's statements as a way to further the conversation. 
Unconditional positive regard refers to the warm and completely uncritical atmosphere that the therapist must create for clients. As Rogers specified for child rearing, such an environment includes having respect for a person's feelings, values, and goals, even if they're different from those of the therapist. Empathy is the third important element. A therapist must not only acknowledge what clients are feeling, but must also understand those feelings. To do so, a therapist must listen closely and carefully to what clients are saying and try to feel what they feel, all while avoiding getting their own feelings mixed up with a client's feelings. And finally, the therapist must cultivate authenticity through a genuine, open, and honest response to the client. A therapist cannot hide behind the role of therapist, but must be able to truly tolerate a client's differences without being judgmental. Another humanistic therapy, this one based on Gestalt ideas, is Gestalt therapy. Developed by Fritz Perls, this therapy is based on the belief that people's problems often stem from hiding important parts of their feelings from themselves. For example, if part of someone's personality is in conflict with what is socially acceptable, the person may hide that aspect of their personality behind a mask of socially acceptable behavior. In this way, the real and the ideal selves do not match. While this may sound remarkably similar to Rogers' person-centered therapy, the difference lies in the role of the therapist. Person-centered therapies are non-directive, whereas Gestalt therapists are very directive. A Gestalt therapy session leads a client through a series of planned experiences with the goal of helping clients to become more aware of their own feelings and thus take responsibility for their choices in life. Such experiences may include a Socratic-type dialogue in which a client argues both sides of their own conflicting feelings. They may be instructed to talk to an empty chair to reveal their true feelings toward a person represented by the chair, or they may take on the role of a person with whom they are in conflict so as to see the conflict from another's perspective. Now it's true that, because of its directive nature, Gestalt therapy may seem very like psychoanalytic or psychodynamic therapy. The difference is that psychoanalysis focuses on a hidden, repressed past. Gestalt therapy, on the other hand, focuses on a denied past. A criticism of humanistic therapies are similar to those for psychoanalysis. There is little experimental research to support the basic ideas on which this type of therapy is founded and, as with psychoanalysis, clients must be intelligent and verbal in order to be treated in this way. They must also be capable of thinking logically, meaning that humanistic therapies are not an adequate choice for a person dealing with a more serious mental disorder, such as schizophrenia. The third type of therapies, behavioral therapies, are drawn from the conditioning work of B.F. Skinner. These therapies emphasize action rather than thinking. The idea is that, through conditioning, a patient could be re-educated to proper behavior. Unlike psychoanalysis or humanistic therapies, behavioral therapies do not focus on why a patient exhibits certain disorders. They just want to fix the problem that presents itself. Behavioral therapy employs various techniques based primarily on classical and operant conditioning. Behavior modification techniques, or applied behavior analysis as it's now called, refers to the use of conditioning techniques to modify behavior. For example, systematic desensitization is a technique in which a therapist guides the client through steps meant to reduce fear and anxiety. This is normally used to treat phobic disorders. The client may learn to relax through deep muscle relaxation training. The client and therapist may then construct a list that begins with the object or situation that causes the least fear to which causes the greatest fear. And with a therapist's help, the beginning with the first item on that list, the client looks at, thinks about, and or confronts the object situation while remaining in a relaxed state. The idea being that the phobic object or situation is a conditioned stimulus that the client has learned to fear. Thus, this technique pairs with the old conditioning stimulus with a new response, relaxation, that is incompatible with the emotional and physical response to fear, leading to a reduction of and in the relief of that fear. Flooding, on the other hand, requires the exposure of the client to the phobic object or situation in a rapid and intense way, rather than systematic desensitization, slow and measured approach. For instance, a person with a phobia of dogs might be exposed to a very friendly small dog who is left in a room with a phobic client. Unable to leave the room or avoid the dog, the client's fear eventually diminishes when he or she comes to realize that nothing bad happens as a result of his or her exposure to the dog. 
were the client able to leave or avoid the dog, this would result in negative reinforcement of the phobia because the client was able to remove the unpleasant stimulus. In practice, flooding has successfully treated some clients with PTSD and OCD. With aversion therapy, the therapist seeks to teach the client to pair an unpleasant, aversive stimulus with a stimulus that results in the undesirable response, which is the current undesirable behavior. For example, if someone is a chronic junk food overeater and would like to eliminate that undesirable behavior, they may go to a therapist who seeks to correct that behavior by teaching the client to associate junk food with an unpleasant odor. Over time, the client's response to junk food changes as they are classically conditioned to smell the unpleasant odor whenever they see junk food. As a result, the client comes to feel nausea instead of craving or hunger at the sight of junk food. Oh, in some cases, pharmacology is intermingling with aversion therapy. One drug, disulfiram, brand name Antabuse, treats alcoholism since it results in aversive reactions when it's combined with alcohol. Operant conditioning techniques are advantageous because they quickly produce results, unlike classical conditioning techniques or those of psychoanalysis or humanistic therapies, which can take years before yielding results. Now, some of the operant conditioning techniques that are in use include modeling as a therapy, and this is based on the work of Albert Bandura. In participant modeling, a model demonstrates the desired behavior in a step-by-step -step gradual process. The client is then encouraged to imitate the model in the same manner. Modeling has been effective as therapy for children with phobia such as dental work, social withdrawal, and OCD. For high-functioning autistic individuals, modeling is also helpful in navigating certain social situations such as a telephone call. Reinforcement can also be effective for treatment of people with behavioral problems. The use of token economies, in which tokens, objects that can be traded for food or candy, treats, or special privileges, to modify behavior is often used with children and has been successful even in mental institutions and with people struggling with depression or schizophrenia. Contingency contracts, in which the therapist and client make a formal contract which outlines each party's responsibilities and goals, can also be used to modify behavior. These contracts have proven very useful in treating specific problems such as drug addiction, eating disorders, and educational problems. And finally, extinction involves the removal of a reinforcer to reduce the frequency of a particular response. In practice, operant extinction often involves removing one's attention from the person who is engaging in inappropriate or undesirable behavior. In child rearing, the time out removes the child from the situation that provides reinforcement. With adults engaging in inappropriate behavior, the simple refusal of other people in the room to acknowledge the inappropriate behavior can be enough to curtail or redirect the client's behavior. Now, of course, there are criticisms of behavioral therapies. Behavioral therapies have proven very effective in correcting disorders that result in specific and discrete inappropriate behaviors. For instance, anxiety that leads to bedwetting, addiction, and phobias. However, they have been largely ineffective in treating the larger and more complex problems of severe mood disorders or personality disorders. Cognitive therapies are drawn from the work of Aaron Beck in an attempt to change the way people think about themselves and their problems. Unlike behavioral therapy, which focuses on the actions resulting from disorder and not on the cause of the disorder, Cognitive therapies focus on the distorted thinking and unrealistic beliefs that lead to the maladaptive behavior, with a particular focus on mood disorders such as depression. The basic idea behind cognitive theory is that the therapist helps their client test in a scientific and objective way the truth of their beliefs and assumptions so as to confront their own distorted thinking and beliefs. Once the recognition of distortion has been achieved, the therapist and client work towards replacing negative thoughts with more positive thoughts and perceptions. This therapy, then, revolves around critical thinking, but a critical thinking that is specifically about one's own thoughts and beliefs rather than outside events and experiences. Beck's therapy identifies a variety of distortions of thinking, of which the most common are arbitrary interference, meaning a tendency to jump to conclusions without any evidence. For example, my girlfriend canceled our date tonight, I bet she's cheating on me. There's also selective thinking, meaning a tendency to focus on only one aspect of a situation, leaving out all other relevant facts that might make things seem less negative. For example, 
I got an A, but Ms. Wild Tabor commented that I kept misspelling the word lead. I'm an awful writer. Overgeneralization is when a person draws a sweeping conclusion from one incident and assumes that this conclusion applies to areas of life unrelated to the incident. For example, I insulted Mr. Jernay yesterday. He'll flunk me and I'll never be able to get a decent job ever. I'm going to end up on welfare. Magnification and minimization occurs when a person blows bad things out of proportion while not emphasizing the good things. For instance, I'm passing all of my classes with A's and B's, but I failed the psych quiz today, so I'm a failure at school. And finally, there's personalization. Personalization occurs when an individual takes responsibility or blame for events that aren't really connected to the individual. For example, when your mom is angry about something that happened at work, but you assume she's angry at you. Now, there are some cognitive therapies that incorporate elements of behavioral techniques, leading to the term cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. Focusing on the present rather than the past, like behavioralism, CBT also assumes that people interact with the world and don't just respond to it via stimuli. Like regular cognitive therapy, CBT assumes that disorders come from illogical, irrational cognitions and that changing the thinking patterns to more rational, logical ones will relieve the symptoms of the disorder. However, like behavioral therapy, CBT will use behavioral techniques, particularly those of operant conditioning, to help clients alter their actions. In other words, CBT isn't just focused on changing the action, but on the client understanding and changing the thoughts that lead to the undesirable action. A newer version of CBT, called Rational Emotive Behavioral Therapy, or REBT, was proposed by Albert Ellis in the late 1990s. REBT teaches clients a way to challenge their own irrational beliefs with more rational, helpful statements. Specifically, it challenges the all-or-nothing types of irrational statements, helping clients realize that life can be good without being perfect. REBT therapists take a very directive role, challenging the client when he or she makes irrational statements. They assign homework using behavioral techniques to modify actions, and they argue with their clients regarding the rationality of their statements. Of course, there are criticisms. Like behavioral therapies, cognitive, CBT, and REBT tend to be relatively short-term therapies, and so are less expensive than psychoanalysis or humanistic therapies. However, Cognitive therapies assume that a client's maladaptive thoughts are the cause of the disorder and not merely a symptom of the disorder. Additionally, it is ultimately the therapist who determines which statements are rational and which are not. That said, cognitive and CBT therapies have proven very successful in treating various disorders, including depression, anxiety, and stress disorders, eating disorders, personality disorders, and even some types of schizophrenia. A group therapy is a type of therapy in which a group of individuals with the same or similar problems meet together with a single therapist. While the therapist may use either an insight, cognitive-based, or CBT style, the best therapies for group settings tend to be person-centered, gestalt, or behavioral therapies. There are advantages to group therapy. For instance, it gives the patient practical experience with one of their biggest problems, getting along with other people. It gives the patient a chance to see how others are struggling and succeeding with similar problems. And there's also more bang for the buck. More people are helped than in a one-on-one -on -one session. There are a couple of examples of group therapy. For instance, the goal of family therapy is to discover the unhealthy ways in which family members interact and communicate with one another and change those ways to healthier, more productive means of interaction. It does involve all members of the family because all of them are part of the problem or problems that they, as a collective client, would like to fix. At times, the therapist may also meet with certain members of the family individually. The purpose of self-help or support groups like AA, cancer, or gambling groups is to ensure that people with a common problem meet regularly with others who have similar problems, without a specific therapist in charge, the idea being that a therapist who has never experienced the problem will be unable to truly understand their position. These groups work without formal leaders. They're free and provide social and emotional support. They tend to be organized by volunteers who lead individual meetings monthly or weekly. These volunteers are also a member of the group, someone who is facing the same problem. Well, there are disadvantages to group therapy. A group therapy obviously isn't appropriate for all situations because 
The therapist is no longer the only person to whom a client is revealing secrets and fears. Some clients may be reluctant to speak freely in front of others. The client must share the therapist's time during the session, so all focus isn't just on them. Furthermore, people with severe psychiatric disorders involving paranoia, such as schizophrenia, may not be able to tolerate group therapy sessions. Additionally, there has been very recent significant criticism of self-help groups simply because there is no verifiable scientific evidence that they work long-term. Nonetheless, very often depicted in popular culture, we have this image of group therapy. And so I threw this comic in just to make you laugh. So, does psychotherapy work? Well, there have been effectiveness studies, and as your text notes, client testimonials suggest that psychotherapy is hugely effective, but there are reasons why skeptics are sometimes dismissive of these testimonials. First of all, people enter therapy in crisis. Well, they'll feel better eventually anyway, and maybe that's what they're reflecting. A clients may need to believe that the therapy was worth the effort, that's self-justification. A clients generally speak kindly of their therapists, even when they agree that the therapy itself wasn't very worthwhile. One of the first studies to look at the effectiveness of psychotherapy was published by Hans Eysings in the 1950s. He studied the reported involvement, or lack thereof, in clients who had undergone psychoanalysis and eclectic therapies. This was a therapy style combining elements from several different therapy techniques. These results were then compared to studies of people who were institutionalized but given no psychotherapy. They were considered the control group. The studies then analyzed everything conducted in the 1930s, so the data was a bit old at the time of the analysis. Nonetheless, Isings concluded that patients receiving psychotherapy did not recover at any higher rate than those who had not received psychotherapy, and that the simple passage of time could account for all of this recovery. Now, as you can imagine, the study created a major controversy. Isinks, whose own work in personality theory was and would be well known, was mostly concerned with the scientific and objective basis of both psychology and thus therapies. He disliked the fact that psychoanalysis, based as it was on Freud's ideas, had little scientific basis. This may have skewed the study. At the same time, though, consider the example of Joan McCord's study from your text. She compared a set of boys from Massachusetts who either received or didn't receive some sort of intervention after getting in trouble with the law. This study, published in the 1970s, found essentially the same thing. No real difference in the life outcomes of the boys who received intervention, they were the experimental group, and those who didn't, they were the control group. The problem with taking these studies at face value, however, is that the control group wasn't necessarily therapy or treatment-free, but rather that their treatments or therapies may not have been recorded in the study. For instance, in the case of the Ising study, most people in the institutions may have depended on one another, formed self-help support groups, or even have found a nurse or physician who served as a sort of sounding board. However, since they weren't scheduled for psychoanalysis as it was understood at the time, they were recorded as going untreated. At the same time, as was revealed in criticism of the Icings report, they only looked at 24 studies of psychoanalysis compared with many more studies of patients in mental institutions. And the same is true of McCord's study. Boys in the control group may have been exposed to a new mentor or authority figure outside of the official program, and they may have nonetheless been treated or thus had a form of therapy. A big problem with evaluated psychotherapy, then, is that controlled studies don't or can't take into account other aspects of the control group's environment. And additionally, psychotherapies admittedly run along different timelines and have different measures of success. Another big problem is experimenter bias. This deals with the clinician's perspective. A therapist obviously expects a therapy to work, eventually, and is also the person evaluating a client's progress. This would clearly affect the outcome of a study on the effectiveness of certain therapies. This is why outcome studies are so important. Obviously, the most effective method of evaluating anything is through experimentation, preferably through controlled research studies, which can then be meta-analyzed for true significance. Studies conducted since the 1950s seem to indicate that, while time is a great healer, as Isings concluded, people undergoing psychotherapy are more likely to improve over time and, depending on their disorder and the type of therapy they underwent, they may improve quite dramatically when compared to a control group. In a more intimate setting, when determining whether the therapy for a specific client is effective, 
there are several factors which need to be assessed. The most important aspect is the client-therapist relationship or the therapeutic alliance. The therapeutic alliance can be affected by cultural, ethnic, and gender concerns. One of the big criticisms of psychotherapy is that its traditional forms have been developed mainly in Western and individualistic cultures and may need to be modified to fit more collectivistic, interdependent cultures. For instance, the talking cures of psychoanalysis and humanistic therapies need to be modified to non-talking cultures, perhaps using nonverbal tasks such as drawing, as a way that is similar to verbal conversation. Otherwise, when dealing with the effectiveness of psychotherapy and the potential problems of cultural, ethnic, and gender concerns, four barriers emerge. Language. When the therapist and client speak different native languages, this can cause significant problems in understanding. Our cultural values. When a therapist and client maintain differing cultural values, this too can impede the therapist's ability to form an empathetic relationship. Even social class can affect it. Clients from impoverished backgrounds may have experiences that a therapist from a more privileged background cannot understand, and vice versa. And then there's nonverbal communication. Because nonverbal communication can differ between cultures and ethnicities, the therapist may misunderstand a client's use of gestures and or eye contact. Now, as we move forward in the 21st century, psychotherapy has increasingly been offered over the internet, resulting in what's called cyber therapy. While this form of low-cost, easily available psychotherapy seems like a win-win all around, there are serious dangers. First of all, regulating the web is difficult, and there is no guarantee that a person who claims to be a licensed cybertherapist is actually licensed. Also, because there may be no face-to-face or even voice-to-voice contact, you might be using avatars, the therapist would not have access to the nonverbal cues that are often critical in assessing a client's emotional and psychological state. So, of course, there has to be something else, something added or something different, that helps a person deal with these disorders. And that, of course, is the topic of biomedical therapies. But that, as I mentioned earlier, is another lesson.